And today's class is pressure waveform acquisition and analysis from the inside out. And the reason we call it that is because we're going to be talking about pressure waveforms that are changing over time. Um, and they all urge, originate from within the, the combustion chamber in the cylinder. And only if a valve were to leak, whether it's an intake valve or an exhaust valve, or uh, we have a scored cylinder wall or a broken ring, those pressure pulses are going to be introduced to other areas, being the tailpipe, the intake manifold, or the crankcase, maybe, maybe even the cooling system. So um, pressure waveform acquisition and analysis from the inside out. That's why I call it that. Now, as Ken mentioned, this is an eight-hour real live CTI class that we usually carry out over two long nights. But uh, we've broken this down into four two-hour sessions, and this is going to be night one, session number one, the first two hours of the class. And my goal to cover – our goal, excuse me, Bryn, I apologize – uh, our objective is to introduce pressure transducers and the different types of transducers that are available that will give us the information we need to make diagnostic decisions. We're going to learn, obviously, first and foremost, to gather and uh, analyze information from within the cylinder through in-cylinder compression waveform analysis by way of cranking and, and when the engine's running as well. We're also going to discuss some auxiliary tools that we can use uh, along with our scope and the waveform to help analyze the waveform itself and make diagnostic decisions, that being cursors and overlay programs, things that will help us make these measurements quite easily. We're going to be uh, gathering information from within the tailpipe and the intake manifold as well, because let's face it, not every engine is configured, particularly nowadays on newer platforms, that we can get to the cylinders that we're interested in. Like a lot of those cylinders under maybe the rear bank of a V6 engine, are tucked underneath an intake manifold and could take two, three hours to even get access to the spark plugs for removal, just so we could perform a test. So we've learned, and we're going to show you, how we can acquire data elsewhere that would provide maybe a stepping stone, give us assurance that if we take that intake manifold off and invest the time, we're definitely going to be uh, pursuing the problem and, and not wasting any time. We're going to be talking about analyzing pressure pulses from within the crankcase and the cooling system as well. And all of these are going to be demonstrated uh, through about, I believe it's about anywhere from 10 to 15 case studies, real life case studies that myself and, and guys like Brent and other friends of mine that have gathered over time doing research and we could show you what it is we're talking about. We're not just going to tell you how to do it. We're going to show you how we did it. <clears throat> and last but not least, certainly not least is how to properly gather the data and store it so we can recover it later and view it. Uh, over the years, Brent and I have shared lots of information together. And at first, I mean, it was like running around with chickens without heads trying to find this information. You know, oh my goodness, where did I store it? Is it on a thumb drive? Is it on my computer at home? But uh, once we started to get <clears throat> our feet beneath us and get organized, it was very easy to find the information we want and, and send it and share it. So we're going to show you how to get organized so we can network with one another and learn together. <clears throat> Excuse me. So like anything, um, in order to be really good at something, you have to understand how it works. In this case, we want to understand how the squiggly lines get on the scope screen and what they mean to us. So to do that, we have to understand the tools we're working with. In this case, the pressure transducer and the lab scope. We want to start at the beginning because we want to keep this nice and easy because it is easy. It just takes some practice. So the first question I have for you guys is what really is a pressure transducer? It's nothing more than a three-wire device. It's going to carry a voltage reference and a ground reference, and that provides a range of operation so the sensor can function. And it's that third wire, that signal wire that comes off this transducer that we're going to couple to our lab scope so we can make some diagnostic decisions. Guys, does this sound like a device that we're already familiar with on a car? If so, give me a couple of examples here in chat. What does that sound like, a three-wire device that runs on a a reference in a ground and can provide information based upon the pressure being placed upon it, whether it's a positive pressure or a negative pressure. You guys can think of some examples, maybe go ahead and type it in chat. What do you think? Yeah. Th throw it up there. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Ladies too, if you're out there. Good. Pedro. Thank you. Pedro broke the ice here. It's the map map sensor, manifold absolute pressure sensor, right? We've got our, or maybe our five volt reference and we've got a ground. And, and whether the intake manifold is, is at atmospheric pressure, is it a deep state of vacuum? 
the voltage coming off that sensor is going to, is going to be cross-referenced in the computer and it's going to equate to a pressure value. So that's exactly what a pressure transducer is. Now the types of pressure transducers we're going to be talking about over the, the next four courses, excuse me, <coughs> are going to be those of an absolute design and those of a delta design. So first I want to talk about pressure transducers, meaning an absolute pressure transducer. Now this, although there are many, many scopes and transducers available out there for us to use, whether you're in, in, in Australia or in Europe, maybe far Eastern Europe or, or here in the States, um, there are many, many, many different scopes available. And we're not here to tell you what scope you should use, but we definitely want you to be familiar with the scope you have and to use it to the best of its potential. The three transducers and, and lab scopes we're going to be focusing on over the next four courses here, excuse me, the next four series, uh, is going to be based around Snap-on, Pico, and automotive test solutions. Not for any particular reason, only because I found, uh, in my experience, most technicians are familiar with one of those three. So again, many, many available options out there. We just chose these three because they're the most popular. <clears throat> now, you're going to hear me reference an absolute transducer. One is going to be a pressure transducer. When I say that, I mean one that's referenced to positive pressure. Meaning when the actual pressure in the area we're sampling from increases, the voltage output from the transducer increases as well. Meaning if we're drawing a line on the lab scope screen and we pressurize that area, the signal is going to transition upwards. And if we put that area into a state of vacuum or negative pressure, the signal is going to go down. However, if I'm talking about a vacuum transducer, it's also a pressure transducer. It functions exactly the same way, except it's inverted. Meaning, when vacuum intensifies, the waveform is going to go up. Not pressure, but vacuum. When pressure goes up, the, vac the trace is going to drop. So I mention that because depending on what device you're using, if you're not familiar with that device, it could give you unanticipated results, and we never want that. Right? When we take our DVOM out of the toolbox or our test light, we want to test it, make sure it's functioning properly so it gives us the right information. Being familiar with the tool or the test you're about to perform is absolutely crucial. So when I say vacuum transducer, it's a pressure transducer, but it's referenced to negative pressure. And when I say pressure transducer, I'm talking about one that's re uh, referencing positive pressure. Now, I want to start off by talking about PICO. Uh, no particular reason, I just chose to talk about this one first. Pico uh, is a phenomenal lab scope and they also make a pressure transducer known as the WPS 500. Now you can buy this transducer standalone here, if I'm not mistaken, it's about $800 US, but you could also buy it in a kit that comes with some accessories and hoses. Um, it's, it's a little bit more money, I think about $1,400 US, don't quote me on that, but give or take. But it's, uh, it's worth its weight in gold, and it's definitely, Bryn, I know for a fact, has made his money back many times over. His return on investment is definitely there because he uses these tools. It gives him a lot of information. What's great about this device is it's almost like three transducers built into one. It's got a selectable range button right here in the middle here. So it's capable of anywhere from minus 15 PSI, right, negative pressure, or I will call it vacuum, all the way up to positive 500 PSI which is great because that pretty much covers all the pressure ranges, right? That full amplitude, that full swing, we're gonna to need to analyze any pressure associated with the engine itself. Um, the transducer itself, if you look on the side here, there's a mini USB jack, I'm gonna call it, that will allow you to plug this thing in and power up its internal lithium ion battery. Now this thing's got one heck of a, a service life on it. I, I know Bryn, he's, he carries his around all day and, and almost rarely has to charge it, isn't that right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, I'm thinking about you guys, if you're anything like myself or Bryn, uh, if we were problem solvers at maybe the dealership or, or maybe serve as a, an acting shop foreman, how often are you guys stationary in one bay, right? Aren't we usually moving around? Let's try out that raise hand button. Those of you guys that are pretty much the man in the shop or the woman, uh, then you're always moving around. Um, it's, quite, it's quite convenient to have a device like this that you can just maybe throw in your pocket or, or carry it around on your tool cart, it doesn't take up much space, and it's self-powered. Now, that selectable range we're talking about here uh, allows for 
Range one provides minus 15 to positive 500 PSI, which I find to be ideal for in-cylinder compression waveforms, whether we're working on a port engine, a port gasoline engine, uh, or a direct injected engine, or even some diesel engines. Um, this thing will handle and display accurately up to 500 PSI and all the way down to minus 15, which is almost a perfect vacuum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Range number two is minus 15 PSI to positive 50 PSI, which is a little bit tighter range, which will give us more resolution. That's ideal for sampling from maybe within the intake manifold, where we can see some positive pressure pulses, but also gives us the resolution that they appear to be uh, nice and uh, viewable for us. Now, range three is a very tight scale, minus five PSI to positive five PSI, which is ideal for very small changes like that you'd find in maybe a cooling system, like in a surge tank, a degas bottle, if you will, or perhaps in the crankcase or even the tailpipe. So it's a very applicable tool to sample from almost any area associated with the engine. And it's very widely used, so there's lots of technical support and information out there as well. Now, Automotive Test Solutions is a company that I work very closely with. I'm not here to support any specific tool, but they do make a very hardy device here, and it works quite well. As you can see, they've got some transducers here, an abundance of transducers. They've got a 30 inches of mercury vacuum transducer. They've got a 500 PSI pressure transducer, even a 5,000. If those of you guys that are maybe into heavy-duty equipment or have to do with a lot of hydraulics, uh, this will definitely measure high pressure and display it accurately on your scope screen. But you see here, there's 300 PSI transducer. Um, you might ask yourself, why would I want to go with a 300 PSI transducer when I could have a 500 PSI transducer? And the answer is screen resolution. You get more, more of a prettier picture painted on the screen. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you coming up here shortly. Now, what's different about these devices is they aren't self-powered like the WPS, meaning they don't have a battery internal to them. Automotive Test Solutions Lab Scope has its own output jacks that drive the transducers. Just like a PCM provides a reference voltage and a ground for our MAP sensor, the ATS Scope provides a reference voltage and reference ground for our transducers. And you could sample you know, eight of them at a time if you'd like. Excuse me, four of them at a time if you'd like. Apologize for that. Um, they also make a separate, I will call it a driver box that is a reference voltage and ground that will allow you to interface these transducers to any lab scope out there. So it's, it, they're very functional. Um, this device here, uh, are there any snap-on users that are, that are viewing us tonight? If so, would you mind raising your hand? Okay, good. Hi, Jamie. Thanks for chiming in. Um, Jamie, I'm not sure if you have, if you're even using pressure waveform analysis yet. And if so, if you're using the snap-on transducers. Um, I will tell you, they tend to be quite expensive. They work, and they work well, but um, not quite as well as some of the other maybe PC-based lab scopes and, and combinations of tools out there. So there is a really neat alternative that works great on a snap-on scope. And it's this device made right here by Fluke. And this is called the PV350. PV standing for pressure and vacuum, upwards of 350 PSI. Now, what's great about this is, like the Pico Scope transducer, the WPS500, it too is a standalone device, meaning it has a battery and it creates its own reference voltage and ground, which makes it convenient. However, this battery is not an expensive lithium ion battery, it's just a nine volt battery. <laughs> and if you're anything like me, uh, I always leave my accessories like my amp probes on. I forget to turn them off. <laughs> and consequently, every time I reach for the darn things, the batteries are dead. So it makes it quite convenient for me when I do leave it on that I don't have to wait forever to charge it, you know, maybe an hour or so. I can just go get another 9-volt battery and get it back up and running very conveniently and inexpensively. One thing you'll notice on a snap-on scope, which we're going to talk about here uh, in, the, in the near future, is that um, just the characteristic of the scope, if you zero out the scope, so your pressure transducers read zero PSI at atmospheric pressure, and you crank an engine over and it starts, the entire pattern seems to shift negatively about 10 PSI. So the scaling's a bit off. 
This little knob that you see right here in the PowerPoint, <clears throat> excuse me, allows you to turn it like an old radio dial and zero out the zero out the waveform as the engine's running. So it allows you to overcome that limitation that the snap-on scope seems to exhibit, that, that not so desirable characteristic. But even more importantly, as you guys see this switch right here, this is selectable. And it offers me an option for an output with pounds per square inch, PSI, or KPA, which stands for kilopascals. It's a metric uh, scaling. Now, um, anybody here that is familiar, or excuse me, like myself, is not real familiar with degrees Celsius, I know that when I achieve 100 degrees Celsius here at sea level, that uh, water will tend to boil. And on the flip side, when I achieve zero degrees Celsius, that water will tend to freeze. But if you told me it was 35 degrees Celsius, I'm not sure if I want to go grab a cooling fan you know, an ice cold drink or a sweater because my mind just is not used to that computation. So I typically like to view things in PSI format. But I mentioned KPA because KPA, look at this, for every one inch of mercury, there are 3.38 kilopascals. Said another way, for every one pound per square inch, there is almost seven kilopascals. So what does that mean to you guys? seven to one, there is seven times more resolution in the kilopascal scale than there is in the pounds per square inch scale. Now, the reason why I mention that is because myself, uh, in the years I've been doing this, very rarely, very rarely do I reflect upon the number scale on the side of the scope screen when it comes to pressure waveform analysis. I'm more concerned with the shape of the waveform. Just like a doctor is to look at an x-ray, it's not so much numbers, it's how, the, you know, how your arm looks in the x-ray or, or your leg. I'm, I'm concerned with how the waveform looks, the shape of it. So putting it in a kilo, kilo pascal scale here allows for a lot better resolution. It gives my scope like a superpower, if that makes sense to you guys. So we're talking about screen resolution, and this is what I'm talking about here. You guys remember Connect the Dots when we were kids. Now, the more dots you have in your picture, the prettier picture you can draw. On the flip side, the less dots you have, the less pretty, the less detail, the less accurate representation of that picture you're going to draw. So I want better screen resolution, and that's why I choose kilopascals, because it gives me a prettier picture. It gives me more bang for my buck. <clears throat> now, in regards to snap-on transducers, they are functional. I grew up with them in pressure waveform analysis, and they're very costly. They make a zero to 100 PSI transducer, and they also make a zero to 500 PSI transducer. Now, both of which are about $500 a piece last time I checked, which is very expensive. And they, when they're coupled with the snap-on scope, they don't work as well as you would expect. They do work, and you can get around using them, as I have for almost 10 years. But um, once you start using a very capable PC-based lab scope with a lot better screen resolution and a lot better zoom capability, you're going to be hard-pressed to go back to a handheld device like, like Snap-on. But I'm not knocking Snap-on. They do work good. Snap-on's device is coupled to this auxiliary port here. Now, this auxiliary port serves as the reference voltage and ground supply that drive the transducer. And that third wire leaving the transducer comes back in is chewed up and spit out here. And when it passes through either channel one or channel two, you can sample up to two pressure transducer inputs at the same time on a snap-on. It is converted in the scope to a pressure scale. So the voltage conversion is done for you. If you don't have a scope that's capable of converting it for you, all right, let me give you an example. Um, on some scopes, we have the ability to take our low amp or high amps probe and put the scope in a amperage reading mode, a current reading mode, that domain, the scope's gonna do the math for you. However, not many scopes, excuse me, not every scope has that ability, meaning we could only view an amp probe's output in a voltage scale. So it would be up to us as technicians to know the conversion. I'll give you, for instance, a very common conversion for some of the high amps probe is for every one millivolt output that comes out of that probe, it equates to one amp of current flow. 
So you'd simply do the math. If you have 100 millivolts on the screen, it equals 100 amps. That same process applies to pressure transducers if your scope doesn't do the math for you. But again, we're not typically concerned with the numbers. It's more so the shape of the waveform. Now, snap-on transducers, um, if I were to ask a question, which one of these would give better screen resolution, the answer would be the 0 to 100 PSI transducer. If these things both, both the 500 and the 100, operated on a 5-volt range, we'd have more dots in a given area for the 100 PSI transducer than we would the 500 PSI transducer. On the flip side, when I'm cranking an engine over, compression values easily exceed 100 PSI, so I wouldn't even fit my waveform on the screen. However, when the engine's running and less air gets in the cylinder, and we're going to talk about that, my waveform would then fit on the screen. So I would always want to use a 0 to 100 PSI transducer because of that screen resolution ability. However, the 0 to 100 transducer, at least the older ones, yielded a not so desirable trait. Anybody here that's familiar with in-cylinder pressure waveform analysis realizes there should be a lot more data down here below this yellow line. And unfortunately, the transducer hates to go into a state of vacuum, so it won't output below that. Now, I've been told through the grapevine that newer snap-on transducers have been redesigned and that they no longer exhibit this trait. I don't know if that's true. The one thing I forgot to mention here, uh, I want to go back. This PV350, the older ones worked great. They output at a frequency. You know, they change fast enough so when it's coupled to your lab scope, you can really see pressure changes quite nicely. However, Fluke, for some strange reason, has redesigned these. I guess they made them less expensive to produce, and they no longer support that, that fast switching frequency that we need to see the accurate representation of the pressure transducer output on the screen. If you were to use a newer one of these devices that you bought, maybe perhaps brand new, it would not work. In fact, it would look like the skyline in New York City on your lab scope screen. It would not be desirable. So if you are going to seek one of these out, Try and find one used maybe on eBay or Amazon or perhaps a, a technician that might be retiring and wants to get rid of one. Um, you definitely don't want a new one. You want an older one. And it has to do with the way it's manufactured now. I wish they would have given them a different part number, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, I know what you mean. They're both, they're both PV 350s, you know? It's kind of a bummer. Yeah. And, and you know, if, if there was a way to tell just by looking at it, it would be easy to avoid that. But I've had several people I, I know reach out and say, hey, what the heck? I bought this transducer like you recommended and it doesn't work. So that is why I mentioned that now. I never realized that initially, but now that I know I want to mention it to you guys so you don't fall into the same trap. <clears throat> so all along we've been talking about an absolute transducer. And again, an absolute meaning one that delivers a voltage value that equates to a pressure value. The next device we're going to talk about is a delta pressure transducer. So if you guys at home are, are watching and wouldn't mind chiming in in chat, what does the word delta mean to you? Please. Just go ahead and type it throw, in the chat box. Throw, throw it up there. Don't be shy. Okay. Well, if you guys don't feel like playing along, that's okay. There we go. We got some answers. Do you? How come I'm not seeing them? There we go. Right. Relative difference. Thanks, Joe. Or change. Delta means change. That's the short answer. And these devices are very sensitive to change. And they are not capable of delivering a voltage output that equates to a pressure value. So I can only see pressure change. I can see really fast activity. These pressure changes in whatever area I'm sampling from. And uh, the device is going to give me some good diagnostic information. So let's talk about that for a minute. Anybody that's dabbled at all in pressure waveform analysis, or at least Heard about it online, maybe in a Facebook chat group or on Diagnostic Network. Um, heard the word first look sensor. First look sensor and pressure pulse sensor, those are brand names. A first look sensor is made by a company called Senex Technology, and that device is a delta transducer. Pressure pulse sensor is made by Autodytex, a company out in Europe, and I believe it's Bulgaria. I don't want to mess that up. And uh, they make a pressure pulse sensor. Both the same device, a delta transducer. First look sensor and pressure pulse sensor is like Kleenex is to tissue, or Nike or Reebok is to a sneaker. 
The point is they are both piezoelectric devices. And what that means is there's a crystal inside that. And when that crystal is stimulated, it creates its own voltage. So we should be familiar with that. Anybody that's ever cooked on a, a propane gas grill remembers the striker, you know, whether it's an electronic ignition or, or a mechanical striker, you push that red button real hard, you hear that loud click and you get a spark that ignites the, the propane oxygen mixture. Um, when, that, when that crystal is struck, it generates a voltage. So we're gonna capitalize on that technology and we get a pressure change that comes into this nipple right here. That piezoelectric crystal is housed inside this device and almost like a drum behind a skin. So as pressure acts upon this, if there's a positive change, it's gonna affect the crystal and that crystal is gonna output a positive voltage. And the harder or the more intense that positive change, the, the taller the voltage amplitude output from the sensor is going to be. On the flip side, if there was a negative change in pressure, right, we introduced a, a vacuum or a suction to this device, it's also going to output a voltage, but it's gonna go down or negative. And the harder that vacuum applied to it is, the further down that voltage output is gonna be displayed on your lab scope screen. So what we're going to do is create an experiment so you can further understand what it is I'm talking about and how these devices tick. If we can gain an understanding how they work, we can learn how we can use them to our advantage. So what I've done here is taken a couple of vacuum hoses, and, or three of them actually, and joined them together with a T. On the left hose here is my absolute pressure transducer. And on the right side here is my delta pressure transducer. And what I'm gonna be doing is coupling both of these transducers outputs to a lab scope screen. And on the other end of this hose is me. I'm gonna be introducing pressure changes to that hose and we're gonna see how they both respond at the same exact time. So what I have here is a screen capture from an ATS, <clears throat> excuse me, an ATS eScope Pro or eScope Elite. And this boasts an option called dual scope mode. And what that allows me to do is plot two scope screens. In this case, they're both synced at the same time running on the same time base. So I have two different outputs on two different scope screens, but on the same PC screen, so I can see them both at the same time. Just like running two individual lab scopes. On the top here is my absolute pressure transducer. This one right here on the left. Now what I've done here is I've indicated with the red arrow that the sensor is zeroed out, meaning it's referencing atmospheric pressure or zero PSI gauge. Now what I've done here is I've taken this transducer, I've grabbed this hose right here, and I went, and I sucked the hose into a deep vacuum and I put my thumb on it so I held vacuum or negative pressure in that hose. Now guys, please raise your hand if you're agreeing with me here. Do you see that this output from the transducer is held low in a negative state? Does everybody see that? Please raise your hands if you do see that. Thanks, Joe. That's it, just Joe? Well, I hope you guys just don't feel like playing along. I hope you're with me. If I took my thumb off that hose as I did here, does it make sense that the transducer would equalize the atmospheric pressure again? I let that stabilize for a second or two just to put some time on the screen, and then a moment later I went like this. And I blew into the hose. So the hose was pressurized, and I once again I trapped that pressure in the hose and held it for a few seconds. And then at this point right here, I took my thumb off the hose, I let the pressure out of the hose, and it equalized the atmospheric pressure again. So let's go down here to the delta sensor. Again, this is both happening at the same exact time. Let's see what happens here with the delta sensor. Once again, it's zeroed out, meaning no change is occurring. When I introduced the vacuum and I held it, I see the negative change, but it flies back up to the zero point again. Why would it do that? We could see here that I'm holding vacuum in the hose. Why would this transducer come down and then come back up again? Can anybody point that out for me? The reason being is it's a delta transducer and it responds to change. So right here, we saw a negative change and that's what caused this output here. And then when the change ceased to occur, it maintained a vacuum, there was no more change. So the sensor, zeroed back out. When I took my thumb off the hose and let air from the atmosphere rush into the hose, there was a positive change. Of course, that's reflected right here. 
But then once again, it zeroes back out because guess what? Once it zeroes to atmospheric pressure, there's no more change. When I pressurize the hose, there's another increase in pressure, right? A positive pressure change. And it zeroes back out because I'm maintaining pressure in the hose. And then right here, I take my thumb off the hose again, and it equalizes the atmosphere, going from a pressure to, to atmospheric pressure, excuse me, going from a positive pressure to zero PSI gauge is a negative change. That's what we see here. So for those of you that are still with me, can, can it be seen that both of these transducers are telling the same story? They're just telling it a different way. We're gonna capitalize on both of these transducers' abilities and their characteristics, their operational characteristics, because they're both valuable to us. An absolute transducer gives us accuracy, right? That numerical value. But a delta transducer is extremely sensitive. So much so that if I coupled that transducer to a hose, as I've done here, and attached a funnel to this hose, if I pointed that funnel towards you and you were talking, like when we sit in class together, I could see those voltage transitions on a lab scope screen. That's how sensitive it is. It actually see the pressure changes in the airwaves as your, as your voice carries and my ear detects it the same way. So what I've done now is taken those same devices, an absolute transducer, and I've also taken the delta transducer and I stuck it in the tailpipe of a good running four cylinder engine. I believe this was a, a 1.6 liter Honda Civic, not that it matters, but the engine is running just fine. The red trace is nothing more than an ignition input, a sink, if you will, just to show that they're both synchronized. It's occurring at the same time. Now, the delta transducer is responding to change, and we can see these transitions occurring here. We're going to explain what these mean in detail, probably in, in course number three. But my point is the absolute transducer is responding very similarly to the delta transducer for a good reason. The transducer being used here, an absolute transducer, is not one that measures in PSI, or not one that measures in inches of mercury. This one is so sensitive, it measures in inches of water. And it's made by automotive test solutions. They call it a tailpipe sensor. It measures in inches of water because 25 inches of water is in one inch of mercury. So it's 25 times more resolute. It gives us a lot better detail. So much so that this absolute transducer can be used in place of a delta sensor. Now, neither of these devices you want to put in a cylinder, an area of very high pressure like that. We're going to talk about where to use these and when later on. These are just meant to, to display change. So I like to use them in areas like the tailpipe, the intake manifold, the crankcase, or even the cooling system. These don't go in the cylinder. Now, the WPS 500, made by Pico, supports a similar operation to a delta sensor. You can put it in zoom mode three, in range three, and it provide, provides enough sensitivity to change that it responds just like a delta transducer. The point is, it has that capability, but being that it's $800, I don't think I'd want to waste an opportunity to use that as a delta transducer when I could be using it as a real life absolute pressure sensor in a cylinder. But it's there. Those of you guys that have two or three WPS 500s, God bless you. But um, you can certainly use one of them for a delta sensor if you really wanted to do that. I wouldn't recommend it. You can get a delta sensor for, for 85 bucks, 50 bucks, 400 hours, whereas a WPS is 800. So the power pressure transducers um, will allow us to view pressure changes within an intake manifold, within the cylinder, the tailpipe, the crankcase, and even the cooling system. And there's a lot of information available for us out there so we can make diagnostic decisions, at least make a decision or not whether or not we have to disassemble an engine for visual inspection. It saves a lot of time. And Brent and I are gonna show you how this works for us. <clears throat> so I wanna ask a question. Please humor me here. We've used a mechanical compression gauge for, God, since the dawn of time when it comes to the automobile and the internal combustion engine. And it served us well for years, right? It provides us direct input to the health of the engine or in particularly the cylinder we're testing. What is it about a gauge that I am limited to? What does a gauge show me? Truly, when you think about the limitation of the gauge, what does it show me? When I say gauge, I mean a gauge coupled to a, a compression hose with a Schrader valve in it. What is that gauge really showing us, that compression test, that mechanical compression test with the gauge? What it's showing us 
is nothing more than peak pressure. Think about this for a moment. If I take a spark plug out of an engine, and uh, very good, Pedro, it captures the highest pressure and retains it. If I screw this pressure gauge assembly into a spark plug hole, and I crank an engine over for, I don't know, 10 to 15 cycles, right? Crank, 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 for 10 or 15 seconds. Every time I produce a compression stroke, whatever air overcomes that Schrader valve, whatever air pressure overcomes the Schrader valve is trapped behind it and is indicated on the gauge. So if the first cycle and the second and the third, the fourth, the fifth engine cycle all can produce 100 PSI of pressure. If on the sixth or the seventh cycle, I have a valve that fails to seat for some reason and I can't retain the pressure in that cylinder and I only produce 30 or 40 PSI, Pedro, what's my gauge going to show me? What's my gauge going to show me if only the eighth cycle produced 40 PSI and the rest produced 100 PSI? It's only going to show me that peak pressure. It's going to show me 100 PSI. Now, assuming for a moment 100 PSI exceeds specification, wouldn't it be safe to assume that the health of that cylinder mechanically is just fine? And if that's the case, I'm going to move on to another area of potential failure. I might say there's nothing wrong with this cylinder. It's mechanical integrity. I'm going to go analyze an ignition system or perhaps fuel delivery or maybe look at some scan data. My point is I'm going to walk away from the engine thinking there's nothing wrong with it when in fact there really is something wrong with it. So for that reason, I'm limited to peak pressure only. I'm going to take that gauge and put it away. From that point forward, I started using a pressure transducer in place of the gauge and I took that Schrader valve out of the hose so I can watch the cylinder breathe. Not only can I continue to see peak pressure, peak compression, what that cylinder is capable of producing, I can see it on all the cycles individually over a period of time. I can capture it in the graph format and keep many, many seconds of data on the screen. But I can also see how that cylinder inhales and how that cylinder exhales. So what this does is it gives me an ability to preliminarily evaluate the engine's health or at least that cylinder's health or provide rapid indication uh, that it does have mechanical integrity. And once you start getting used to this line of analysis, you can pinpoint accuracy, accurately pinpoint a fault in an engine or, or prove it's healthy. So you can do all this by simply removing a spark plug and capturing as much data as you would, the same amount of time invested as a traditional compression test on one cylinder. So what can a transducer show us? I mean, Bryn, tell me if I'm lying here. We can see valve sealing issues quite easily. We can see compromised pistons, broken piston rings, maybe a scored cylinder wall. We could even see damaged connecting rods. I'm not talking about the ones that are bent in half because they swallowed a puddle, right? And, and the rod comes through the block. I'm talking about the ones that are barely tweaked like that. Enough where it causes a drivability symptom without any compression loss, excuse me, uh, cylinder leakage. We can easily see exhaust restrictions when we operate the engine under high load. Um, we can see cam timing that's way out. We can see when carbon builds up, you know, right now, gasoline direct injected engines, um, we are seeing a ton of carbon issues, particularly in the induction side of the engine. And these restrictions become quite visible once you learn what the data is telling you here. Uh, we can monitor camshaft phasing dynamically, why the engine's running. We can see a cam phaser's ability to shift to its full, uh, full phase capacity or not. We can see if one gets hung up. What about Honda and Subaru and, and Nissan and, and some of the high-end European vehicles that are altering valve lift and duration to change the breathability characteristics of the engine? We can see those operate dynamically as well. We can even see the slightest bit of metal shaved off an individual cam load. Or, or what about the active fuel management and, and displacement on demand lifters that are, that are becoming a real nuisance on almost all the platforms? We can see those failures occur dynamically right in front of us on a scope screen. So once you understand what the scope, the squiggly lines on the scope is telling you, it can help decipher a lot of mechanical faults without taking anything apart. So anatomy of a compression waveform is where I want to build uh, from. And the in-cylinder waveform is where we're going to begin. Why? Because the pressure changes that we see elsewhere begin from within the cylinder. So before we get too carried away, I don't want you guys to think about compression waveform analysis and get lost in that, like maybe become intimidated by it. 
I want you to think about this right here, this simple syringe, because many of us have had this in our hands and we can anticipate how it's going to behave depending on what we do with this and what we do with our thumb up here. So for a moment, I want you to picture this syringe as it is in front of me here. Relative to the pressure in this room with this syringe opening here exposed, how much pressure difference is there inside this syringe versus what's in this room that I'm sitting in? What do you think? Is there a difference? There's no difference, right? The pressure inside this syringe is exactly the same as the pressure inside this room. But this syringe is currently filled with some air, a mass of air. And there's a volume here that that air has filled. So if I take this syringe and I plug it just like this, so no air could come out, and I depress this plunger just like this, right? Just like this, and no air comes out. What happens to the area, the size of the area in the syringe as I squeeze this? The area gets smaller. Now think about it, if no air can leak out and the area gets smaller, what has to happen to pressure? It's simply the physics that are involved there. Got to increase, Brandon. It has to, right? It just makes sense. And then you, you can anticipate what this is feeling like as I'm squeezing this. The harder I push up, the more this thing's fighting me because pressure's beginning to build. So if I were to somehow make it all the way to the top, I'll call it top dead center, right? A full stroke and no air leaked out. It's plain to see that if I come right back down to where I started, even if I don't take my finger off of here, pressure is going to be, once again, zero PSI gates, the same as it was in this room around me. So referencing my PowerPoint here, you see we started off with zero PSI gates. For the sake of argument, let's say we produced 100 PSI of compressor, compression. Excuse me. When we pull that plunger back down to where we started and no air leaked out, we should once again be at zero PSI gauge. But I'm gonna change the scenario up a little bit. Let's suppose I repeat that process, but this time some air leaks out, just like that. And instead of making 100 PSI, I only made 80 PSI. As I begin to retract this plunger towards the beginning where I started, we go from 80 to 70, and then to 60 and 50 PSI, and then 40, 30, 20, 10, zero. I'm at zero already, but I still have some travel to go here with my plunger. If I continue to pull this down, watch this. What's fighting me here? What do you call that, Brent? I call that uh, low pressure vacuum. <clears throat> yeah, if it's lower than atmospheric, I like to refer to it as vacuum. This same thing can be exhibited on a lab scope, and that's what we're going to talk about here. How does this relate to an in-cylinder compression waveform? So before we go further, I want to remind you, we are going to plot these waveforms, these signal outputs from the transducer on a lab scope screen over time. And it's these changes that occur over time that we're interested in. So anything that occurs to the left side of the scope screen, right, to the left side of maybe this point right here is happening earlier. So we'll call that advanced or early. Anything that happens closer to the right side of the screen relative to any particular spot on the scope is happening later or retarded. So how does this relate to this in-cylinder compression waveform? First, I wanna start with the strokes, the four strokes of this four cycle engine. As the piston nears top dead center, pressure should be the highest. As the piston overcomes top dead center, it begins to descend on what would be the expansion stroke. We call it the expansion stroke or the decompression stroke rather than the power stroke because keep in mind we've got the spark plug removed and this cylinder is disabled. It's not capable of combustion. So we're going to call this the expansion stroke because the cylinder is decompressing as the crankshaft continues to rotate and draw the piston and rod assembly down the bore of the combustion chamber. Now here is zero degrees and 720 degrees later, the cycle repeats itself. So one full engine cycle equates to 720 degrees or two rotations of the crankshaft. So this is top dead center. This right here would be bottom dead center. Top dead center, bottom dead center, and top dead center again. 
So going from compression, top dead center compression, down to bottom dead center would be 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Now, right before we go up on the exhaust stroke here, starting at this 180 degree mark and our piston changes direction, something has to open. We have to make an opening for the exhaust contents to disappear to as our piston moves up on the exhaust stroke because otherwise it becomes a second compression stroke. We leave the exhaust valve open so the piston can expel those ex exhaust contents. And that is why no pressure is building in this area right here. Said another way, if we had a, if we had an exhaust restriction that limited the amount of air or spent exhaust contents this piston was capable of displacing, we would start to see pressure rising here. As we get to top dead center of the exhaust stroke, our 360 mark, the piston will once again change direction and it will, uh, the piston will descend on its induction stroke. It'll continue to descend till it gets to bottom dead center, this 540 degree mark right here. The piston will change direction and start to head towards the cylinder head and will once again produce compression. So just covering the strokes here is what we talked about. Again, we wanna talk about how this relates to what you see on the PowerPoint presentation. So this area right here, I want you to stop for a moment. And when I said this earlier, and I said we're equal to atmospheric pressure here, I want you to picture this being a cylinder instead of a syringe. And picture this engine is at idle in front of me. And right when I go on the induction stroke, I stop my movie and I hit pause. I'm down here just like Bryn is at sea level. I'm up in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia and Bryn's down next to the palm trees in Florida. So we are familiar with engine intake manifold vacuum values to be around 20 to maybe 22 inches of mercury. Now I know any of you guys that may be up in the clouds in Denver will realize a different number like 17 or 18 inches of mercury to be healthy. And that's because of the pressure differential in the atmosphere from up in the clouds as compared to down here. But just for nice round numbers, we're gonna call 20 inches of mercury, strong engine back. So this area right here is the intake stroke. And the intake stroke occurs on this idling engine, right? When the intake valve is open and the piston starts to descend. When that intake valve is open, the cylinder is exposed to that vacuum storage tank that we call an intake manifold. Meaning the cylinder will also have 20 inches of mercury in it. So this area you see right here before the compression tower is this same area you see right here. It's just from a different cycle. So watch what I'm gonna do here. If I start off with 20 inches of mercury right here and I go up on compression and nothing comes out, when that piston retracts, just like we did with our syringe, back down towards bottom dead center, we should have the same amount of vacuum level in the cylinder as we did when we started. And that would be reflected by this. We could almost draw a straight line horizontally through the bottom of this waveform. That indicates that this cylinder is indeed sealing and none of its charge had leaked out. So we're in a state of vacuum here, and I want to remind you that anything on a lab scope screen when we're measuring in a domain for pressure is reflected vertically. So pressure goes up and down, and time is always reflected horizontally. So right here, we're in a state of vacuum, as we just discussed, and all of a sudden, that vacuum disappears suddenly. That vacuum disappears suddenly. It's reflected here as a steep change in pressure in a very short period of time. Bryn, what do you think happened right here for a change in pressure to occur? Something had to open, right? An exhaust valve had to open, right? Yeah, the exhaust valve opens right here. So Bryn, do you think this point here holds some significance? Very significant. What's that tell you? What happened? Told, my, told me that I, the exhaust valve opened. Right, EVO or exhaust valve opening. So if, this, if I knew where this was supposed to occur, let's pretend I anticipated occurring here. If it happened over here, instead of over here. Wouldn't you call that early or advanced? Absolutely. Or if it didn't happen here where it was supposed to and it happened all the way over here, wouldn't you call that uh, retarded or late? Yes. So this point holds some significance. It infers camshaft timing or at least cam lobe timing, this valve timing for this cylinder. 
So this opened up and now our piston changed direction and starts to head north. And we discussed why pressure does not build in this area here, at least it shouldn't, because our exhaust valve is open and our cylinder is, is expelling those spent exhaust contents out the exhaust valve. Now, as we get to top dead center, our intake valve will open up and our cylinder will again be exposed to the intake manifold and which should cause it to drop suddenly here. So this sudden pressure drop, just like this sudden pressure rise, indicates that our cylinder was suddenly exposed to manifold vacuum. Meaning what, Bryn? What happened right here? The intake valve had to open right there. Right. It, it just makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So this shows where the intake valve opened and can once again infer camshaft timing, or at least valve timing for this engine. So we draw down into a vacuum as we should expect to, and then our piston begins to contribute to the intake manifold, just like the other four, excuse me, the other three or the other five or the other seven cylinders we're doing to that intake manifold. We'll continue to draw into a vacuum and contribute to the intake manifold until we get to bottom dead center. And then the piston changes direction. Now here's something that's goofy. Brent, we talked about what happens with pressure if that piston continues to go up and that cylinder is sealed. We build pressure, right? Yeah. So if my piston begins to go up as it does, starting right here, why wouldn't pressure build in the cylinder? How come it's staying low here for, it seems like an incredibly long time? That's what's cool about this stuff is you really start to understand what's happening in the engine. That's totally normal. And what's happening there is the intake valve's not closing until almost a third of the way through the compression strip. Yeah, so I know we haven't talked about the whys and hows, but um, we're going to cover that. But my point is that piston is indeed heading north here. But we're not building pressure because the cylinder is not yet sealed. And Bryn nailed it right on the head. It's because the intake valve is not open. So what had to happen, uh, I hope, I want to see if Pedro can answer this, if he's still watching here, because I'd love to get you guys to also contribute. We're all here to learn together. What had to happen right here? Uh, Pedro, please, if you will, I'm going to give you like, 10 seconds. If not, I'm going to ask my buddy Bryn to answer again. <laughs> hey, there he is. Thanks, Pedro. I appreciate your, your interaction, pal. The intake valve had to close here. And how do I know that? Because watch my hand. No pressure, no pressure. And then all of a sudden, pressure, had to be, pressure started to build. Why? The area was getting smaller, and now we trapped the air inside that syringe or that combustion chain. So this point holds some significance. It tells us when the intake valve closed. This point holds some significance. It tells us when the intake valve opened. And this one tells us where the exhaust valve opened. So there's a lot of information here available to you. And we're going to cover a lot more as time goes by. So you see how simple that is, Pedro? When I start to think about this, I can relate to this. I'm trying to learn what's on my PowerPoint here. If I could relate that to this, it makes better sense in my mind. And, and that's how I learned to do it. So people ask me all the time, hey, can you take a look at this compression waveform and let me know what you think? And I say, sure. I typically say, sure, unless I'm busy or something. But um, these are some of the characteristics or, or key signatures, points of interest that, that I care about, that I reference when I analyze one of these waveforms. The first one you'll, excuse me, the first one you'll see here is what I call good running compression. That's a great question. What is good running compression? I'm going to say that depends. First of all, it depends on the geometry of the engine. Do you have a stroke like this with a bore size like this? Or do you have a really long stroke with a really small piston? These things come into play. Also, what kind of engine design is it? Does it support Atkinson cycling? And what phase is the camshaft in? These are all things that come into play. Is it single overhead cam? Is it dual overhead cam? Is it turbo or supercharged? Um, are we up in the clouds in Denver? Are we down here in, uh, in the palm trees with Bryn? with the coconut drinks, you know what I mean? <laughs> the pressure in the atmosphere determines how hard that air is pressing on that throttle plate, meaning how much air can easily get into that engine versus not so easily. For the same reason, athletes have trouble breathing up in the clouds. That pressure differential isn't there to help assist getting their air into their lungs. Engines suffer from the same problem. So running compression or cranking compression varies. But how do I know what good is? I'm not really concerned with my peak pressure here. All that good stuff that we're going to be talking about is found down here in the bottom of the waveform. And when you have a problem down here, it's going to reflect up here. So don't be too concerned with numerical values when it comes to running compression. 
we're going to see a fall in the shape of the waveform, I assure you. So we talked about the significance of even pockets. It infers that the cylinder did in, indeed seal, and we didn't lose any cylinder charge, whether it was a leak or due to late intake valve timing. We'll talk about that more in some detail. We also see defined valve events. We want to see changes occur like that when a valve opens or when a valve slams shut. And if it doesn't open or doesn't slam shut properly, we are not going to see rapid transitions in a, in a vertical direction or, you know, up and down. We are going to see slow transitions. So what I'm getting at is instead of seeing, instead of seeing a check mark like this, let's see if I can draw this with my mouse. Is that showing up on the screen, Bryn? Yeah, yeah, it's there which would indicate a rapid change in pressure, we're gonna see something like this indicating a slow change in pressure. Now we've all grabbed a can of beer or a soda that we were trying to be cautious that we didn't wanna get it on our, you know, our suit or our nice shirt before we go out. So we like to open those cans slowly and they go and they let the pressure out over time. If we were to measure that same can with a pressure transducer, that waveform would look something like this. Okay. But if I grabbed that and went real fast, we'd see a change like that. If that makes sense to those of you guys that are watching, please put your hands up. That would be cool if we could put a pressure transducer in a soda can. I'm going to try that. Hey, Pedro, once again, thank you for, uh, thank you for getting back. And Joe, I appreciate the feedback, my friend. So that's, that's the significance of defined, um, defined valve events. Oops, I want to turn off my, my pen here. There we go. Um, we talked about back pressure, the significance of the cylinder trying to avoid itself of the spent content. If it can't do that in any way, shape, or form due to a, uh, maybe somebody backed up into a wall and crushed a muffler or uh, ran over a speed bump or a curb and crushed the exhaust pipe or we've got a, a melted down catalyst, those are all oppositions to uh, exhaust flow and they could cause back pressure to occur. So we're going to see that area, excuse me, reflected in this area here. But the one thing that we didn't talk about yet is straight towers. And we're going to talk about that right now. Now, this is not something I typically measure when I'm analyzing a waveform. This is simply done as a demonstration to give you an idea of what I mean by straight towers. If you could picture an engine running at, let's say, a stable idle of 800 RPMs, that crankshaft is going to continue to rotate at the same speed. When that piston and rod assembly is connected to that journal, the piston should ascend at the same speed as it descends. And if that cylinder is healthy, we should produce a pressure increase at the same rate as a pressure decrease. So if we were to take a vertical cursor and drop it down the center line of this compression tower, and then take a horizontal cursor and drop it across the center line of this compression tower, we could then measure the time difference between the left side and the center and compare it to the right side and the center. And you can see there's only a difference of about a millisecond here. Now, again, I'm not telling you to measure this and count the numbers, but this is a good example of a healthy cylinder indicating what I would call straight or symmetrical towers. Let's take a look at an unhealthy cylinder, one that does exhibit a leak. When we make that same measurement, there's a difference from side to side of almost five milliseconds. Now, forget the numbers. Pedro, take a good look, and Joe, take a good look at this tower here. Wouldn't you agree that this tower tends to lean towards the right a little bit? Right? There's more meat on this side, center cursor, than there is on the other side. That's what I call a leaning tower or an asymmetrical tower, and that's not desirable. That indicates that the cylinder lost some of its charge, whether there's a significant leak or a significantly late intake cam timing that cylinder has lost its charge. Yeah. And you could see it, you know, you don't yeah. have to measure it. I think I know what's happening. These guys are one finger typers. And by the time they start to get an answer out, maybe. <laughs> I so. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your significance. And if you guys are holding back for any reason, please don't be, please don't be freaked out by it or feel intimidated. We are all here to learn together. Nobody, there's no stupid questions and nobody's going to bite your head off. Um, we, we, any question you have is going to help everybody that's watching. Believe me, we see it over and over again. Now, um, just like I say, you will smell smoke before you see fire. You are always going to see uneven pockets or what I like to call pocket differential. When you have a leak, even a small leak, only when the leak gets significant and those pockets really, really, really start to show some differential 
are you going to see leaning towers? So leaning towers shows up when things get really, really bad. So bad, you almost giggle with the scope screen like, wow, look at this. But you're, ten, you're going to tend to see uneven pockets or pocket differential more so as leak starts to worsen. Now, regarding the syringe, if you remember the analogy, or excuse me, the demonstration where we went up on compression and we lost some air and we draw down into a vacuum, like my hand is displaying here, it's fighting me. If we start off at manifold vacuum, we go up on compression and we lose some, as I've done here, as that piston starts to descend and I pull a vacuum, what do you think is going to happen to this pocket down here? Where's it going to go? That pocket's not going to go here where it belongs. It's going to drop way down. It's going to be farther, yeah. Yep. And the worse the leak is, the further down that pocket's going to go. It's going to drop way, way down. And something to consider, we've had questions in the classes before. When Brandon talks about the, the leak during, and he's using the syringe, it's a leak during the compression stroke. And generally, that's what you'll have is you, you have more pressure there, so you're going to, the leak's going to be more evident under the compression stroke. And they tend to seal during the expansion uh, stroke. So that's why, you know, he's leaking some out during that, when he's pushing that syringe in and he's holding his thumb over the end when he's pulling it back out. And you'll see a deeper ex uh, expansion pocket because of that. Um, some folks are confused because they assume that it's going to also leak on the way in. And it can, but it's usually a much larger leak that would cause that leak on the expansion stroke as well as the compression stroke. Brent, that's an excellent point. And yeah, like Bryn noted, most leaks we're going to experience when it comes to drivability is due to some turbulence because the airflow across that spark plug. So it's these very small leaks that can make a real significant impact on drivability. But when you were talking about a hole, like somebody took a torch to a valve, uh, excuse me, the face of a valve because it was improperly seated and it burnt up. I mean, we are going to have compression towers that are this big. You know what I mean? We're going to, instead of producing 70 or 80 PSI of compression, we're going to see something like 10 or 15 and the waveform is going to look absolutely terrible but you're going to see that i've got some demonstrations showing that uh coming up in some of the case studies likely on night three maybe maybe even night four depending on how how far we get so i hope that begins to make sense to you now when i'm looking at in cylinder waveforms you got to ask yourself what are we trying to accomplish here when we monitor in cylinder compression waveforms whether we're cranking the engine or running the engine at idle, or elevating the RPM, or snapping the throttle, or even performing a brake torque or a power brake event, um, we are changing the breathability, the characteristics of that cylinder, the ability to get air in, squeeze it, and then get the air out. We really are monitoring pressure changes over time. The waveform is always referenced to atmospheric pressure, which is indicated right here on the screen by my zero line. Um, and what that means is if this is zero right here, Anything below this red line, pardon my shaky hand here. Oops, not that part. <laughs> Anything below this red line right here is going to be negative pressure or vacuum. And that is what's responsible for these pockets, the intake pocket and the exhaust pocket. It's pressure differential between the throttle plate and what's in the cylinder here. So if we crank the engine over, we're not going to have those deep pockets like we see right here. These pockets might drop down only a little bit, and that's very normal. So running waveforms and cranking waveforms are both necessary to gather, as well as elevated RPM, snap throttle, and, and power brake or brake torque conditions. And we're going to talk about the details and the significance of those later on. But back to what I was saying here, monitoring pressure waveforms over time is basically just looking for pressure differentials by moving air mass or a volume of air across restrictions and seeing how it reflects on the scope screen. Almost like voltage drop testing when we energize a circuit. So in order to aid in an analysis, we're going to begin to use cursors. We're going to capitalize on the power of our lab scope and we're going to use these cursors to aid in analysis. Now, first I'm going to demonstrate ATS here. Um, who knows why? Maybe alphabetical order, ATS. Um, the first thing we're going to do is press this cursor button, and it's going to plot these two white cursors right here. It gives us the ability to grab. I'm going to click on one white one, and I'm going to drop it somewhere in this area over here to intersect the center line of that compression tower, as we demonstrated earlier. I'm then going to grab the second cursor and do the same thing on the other side of the screen through the second compressor tower. That's going to give us the ability to reference 
an entire engine cycle, otherwise stated 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Now I'm gonna come up here then, I'm gonna press mark camshaft, and what that's gonna do is allow the scope to reference a purple cursor at the point I put my white cursor, and another one over here, and it's gonna make one, two, three, four equal partitions across this in-cylinder cranking or running compression waveform. And why did I choose four, or why does the scope choose four? To represent the four strokes of the four cycle engine. So it's gonna partition it four ways so we can see the first 180 degrees, the second 180, which gives us 360, the third 180, which gives us 540 degrees, and the final 180, which gives us our 720 degree engine cycle. I also have the ability to analyze other areas of the engine by way of altering the amount of partitions I have here. So if I'm sampling in an intake manifold, or I'm sampling in a tailpipe, or in a crankcase, or, or even the cooling system, I am looking for how each cylinder is contributing to that area, good or bad. So however many cylinders the engine I'm analyzing is configured with is how many ways I want to partition a waveform that is common to all cylinders. In-cylinder waveforms are partitioned four ways. Waveforms derived from the intake, the crankcase, the cooling system, or the tailpipe, i.e. an area that any cylinder contributes to, will be partitioned by how many cylinders my engine's configured with. So in this case, I chose eight partitions. Why? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight partitions, so I could see how all eight cylinders of this engine contribute to the intake manifold or the tailpipe or the crankcase or the cooling system. It's kind of like doing a lineup and we want to find the odd man out. That's the purpose of these partitions. So how do these partitions work? We reference one to a top dead center compression event and the other to the other top dead center compression event or, or maybe an ignition sink. We want to see when a cycle repeats itself. Ignition number one, 720 degrees later, ignition number one to represent top dead center, one complete engine cycle. We know that equates to 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. So if I cut 720 degrees in half, I get 360 degrees. And if I do that again, I get 180 degrees. And if I take this 180 and I partition it six different ways, I get 30 degree increments. So said another way, if this is bottom dead center, 180 degrees, this is 30 degrees before bottom dead center. This is 60 degrees before bottom dead center. And this would be 90 degrees before bottom dead center, just like this is 30 degrees after top dead center, right? Anything to the right is retarded or, or, or uh, later. Anything advanced to the left is before. So you can accomplish the same result using a picoscope. It just goes about, you just go about it a different way. So what we do here is I will take these green ball cursors, I call them, they're really rulers, and I'm going to drag them, the first one, and I'll plot right down to the center of this compression tower, and then I'll grab the second one, and I'll do the same thing. And then if I click on this rulers tab down here, I will get a drop-down menu where I can click however many partitions I want. In this case, I think, uh, let's see if I can do this here. Yeah, this says four. So I put four partitions here, one, two, three, four. Just like the ATS, I can adjust this however many ways I want. I can right click over, or excuse me, click this right arrow and change it to five or six or seven or 10 if I want. So you can just go about it a different way. What I like about this is if you look over here, this square represents a vertical cursor that I can measure with. If I click on that square and drag it to a particular point, it will display up here in this box, which is currently minimized. You can't see the box. It will display <clears throat> how many degrees of crankshaft rotation my cursor is currently representing. So if I put it right here, it would equal 180. If I put that cursor right here, it might say something like 86 or 92. It depends on, you know, where I place it. It'll indicate the point in the crankshaft phase that my cursor's at.
So this, in my opinion, is a bit easier to use than, than that of the older versions of ATS. So you just go about it in a different way. You're accomplishing the same goal, just with two different tools. So when I use cursors, first thing we're doing is we're plotting the time for the 720 degree engine cycle. We'll use these cursors to find a point that an event occurs, like an exhaust valve opening or an intake valve closing or even an ignition strike to infer ignition timing. We can find a duration of event, right, by using two cursors and finding the delta time between the two, the time difference between the two, or the difference in crankshaft rotation degrees. It will show how long an event lasts. So you, for duration, we could help infer uh, a cam load. If we have a duration on a healthy cylinder that might last for, I'm going to make up a number, 200 degrees of crankshaft rotation. If I measure that same event in my suspect cylinder and I only see 140 degrees of crankshaft rotation, it could help infer that there's something wrong with the cam lobe or the lifter itself. So lots of good information there once you learn how the squiggly lines get on the screen and once you learn how to capitalize on the functionality of the tools. So again, quickly prove that ignition timing is a potential fault. I want to ask you guys real quick, has anybody ever seen the inside of a crankshaft balancer that's, you know, coupled with the other, with the outside with rubber that it's sheared? And I don't mean it has some run out to it that shakes you out of your seat or throws the belt, but I mean when it just becomes disassociated from the crankshaft. Many times the reluctor on the crankshaft for the CKP is referenced to that point that got disassociated. My point is if the PCM knows to trigger the ignition based upon that CKP input, it's now happening out of phase from the crankshaft. It's going to cause one heck of a drivability problem. It's going to feel like a bad fuel pump. It's going to feel like a restricted exhaust. It's going to feel like a misreporting mass airflow sensor or even a hole in an induction boot. It's going to feel like any one of those because the symptom's going to be the same, low power. But if you couple that ignition event with the pressure transducer output from derived from within the cylinder, when we know where top dead center occurs, we know the ignition event should occur near top dead center. And when this happens to the crankshaft reluctor, that ignition timing event moves way, way, way late, typically. So very easy to prove out on a scope screen. Now, those were vertical cursors. We also have horizontal cursors that will measure the difference in amplitude, or in this case, pressure. So we can see pressure changes and measure those changes over time as well. Really good to prove out restrictions, whether it's restrictions for the air getting into the cylinder, or restrictions for the exhaust gases leaving the cylinder. Just a, just a quick tip, if you're looking at ignition and in cylinder captures, make sure that you're, obviously you're removing the spark plug, uh, so make sure you ground that uh, ignition lead or coil so that you don't zap your pressure transducer. That is definitely possible. Yes, Keep and that in mind. The, the chips, the electronics inside these transducers are highly susceptible to magnetic interference and things like that. So EMI from an ignition event can easily take out a transducer, just like static electricity from your body can, can take out an ECU if you're not properly grounded. So we always want to ground our ignition events because we just want to see the impulse occur. We're not concerned with how the ignition events carried out. We just want to see when that strike physically occurs in that 720 degree engine cycle. So, um, just a reminder here, a visual representation of advanced timing, meaning it happened earlier than it should have, versus timing when it's correct. There should be a line. See if I can do this here. Uh, there's getting fancy, getting I'm fancy like, tonight. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm trying out some features here. <laughs> a line right here to represent a vertical cursor. I don't know why it disappeared for some reason. That, that uh, 180 degree mark. Yeah, the 180 degree bottom dead center mark. Don't ask me to, to draw that here because that's going to be a mess. But um, if we would call this proximity to this line normal cam timing, this event is happening far to the left, otherwise known as advanced. This event isn't happening here where it's supposed to. It's shifted to the right, so it's retarded. That's what that's indicating there. Now this screen, this slide, if you will, is meant to describe to you what I typically anticipate seeing regarding valve timing. But I will warn you, these are very soft rules of thumb. And I advise you to collect known good. Be familiar with the car you're working on. 
before you make any decisions about valve timing or cam timing particularly based upon the event you just captured. Because on conventional engines, maybe overhead camshaft design with no camshaft phasing or, or anything fancy, just a conventional engine, maybe even a push rod engine. It's very typical to see an exhaust valve opening or EVO occur about 45 degrees before bottom dead center, but not on every engine. It's very typical to see an intake valve opening right at the top dead center 360 mark. But again, we see that happen in other areas, shifted to the right or even earlier, many, many times, depending on the design of the engine, what its goal is to accomplish. Uh, whether it's a uh, power, high power output, a high output engine, or, or for very few efficient, like you see in some of the engines that post Atkinson cycling. Exhaust valve closing, otherwise known as EVC, is extremely difficult to see. Um, almost invisible, if you will. So I don't even look for it because it doesn't really help me make diagnostic decisions. But um, there's a trait called deepest vacuum, and that typically occurs right after the intake valve opens, where the waveform drops initially to its lowest point. That can help infer when an exhaust valve closes, but it doesn't really tell you exactly when the exhaust valve closes. We typically see that that deepest vacuum occurs somewhere near 40 degrees after the top dead center 360 mark. An intake valve IVC typically occurs about 55 to 60 degrees after the 540 mark, that bottom dead center mark. Now the significance to me telling you a bunch of this stuff is this, intake valve timing is absolutely critical to compression. If we close an intake valve early, well, let me back up. This represents 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation, meaning halfway up is 90 degrees. Half over again is about 45 degrees there. So we typically close an intake valve right in this area here. I can capitalize on this much stroke, about 120 degrees of crankshaft rotation to build compression. If I close an intake valve late, maybe not at 60 degrees after bottom dead center, but maybe 75 degrees or, or 90 degrees or heck 120 degrees if it gets real late. I can only capitalize on this much stroke to build compression. So a significantly late intake valve or intake cam is going to allow lower compression, whereas a very advanced intake valve or intake cam closing, excuse me, intake cam advancement or intake valve closing is going to trap more air in the cylinder and boost compression. When we see timing issues on the exhaust side, it, it rarely affects compression at all. It does affect the contents that the cylinder is filled with, right? If we close an exhaust valve late, as the piston goes down on the induction stroke, its intent is to inhale fresh air and fuel. But since the exhaust valve is still open, it's going to fill partially or more than normal with exhaust gases. We know exhaust gases to be inert. So it's going to affect the combustion process. This is the same reason why an engine runs terrible when we open the EGR valve at the wrong time. So exhaust valve timing affects combustion quality and intake valve timing affects compression. Again, a reminder, we want to definitely keep in mind what known good looks like. We don't want to take these, uh, these readings that we have on this page as gospel. Camshaft, Timing and variable cam timing and valve lift and duration, these strategies used to maximize engine output, fuel efficiency, and low emissions are strategies that drastically affect how a waveform presents. And if we assume something is wrong with an engine because of the waveform, because it's we're worked, something we're unfamiliar with, we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble. So be aware of that. Experiment on known good vehicles and keep a library of the captures you do derive. And reach out to guys like, like Bryn on Facebook that share their knowledge and experiences with others because it's, a, it's an invaluable uh, asset. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is good running compression? Again, I'm not so much concerned with the number. I am concerned with the shape of the waveform. Good running compression is typically half of what cranking compression is, and that's because of the clock time involved in the engine cycle. An idling engine is four times as fast as a cranking engine typically. So we have one fourth of the time to fill the cylinder when an engine's at idle, as we do when we're cranking it. So it goes to show 
it should make sense that we get less air in an idling engine with the throttle closed than we do with a cranking engine. Um, we have straight towers and even pockets, as we should, because the cylinder should seal on a normally timed engine without a fault. We see a crisp, clean, defined exhaust valve event. This one isn't quite occurring at 30 degrees before bottom dead center. It's more like maybe 25 or 28, which again goes against that 45 degrees I described in that last slide. But again, every engine varies. We also see a crisp, clean opening intake valve event as well as a closing event. And we see our good peak vacuum event occur at about 40 degrees, 30 to 40 degrees after the top dead center mark. So this is what I would call normally timed engine, what the waveform should look like. Now, here's an example of a late camshaft timing occurring on something that has a single overhead camshaft design. So, Brent, why the heck would I tell you that? Single overhead camshaft. What does that mean to you? You're, you're muted, my friend. <laughs> Basically, if, if uh, an exhaust event is affected, um, if it's one camshaft that has the exhaust and the intake valves, then your intake valve timing is going to be affected. Exactly. So if you take the time to realize, verify what it is you're working on, be familiar with your opponent, right? Know the enemy. Um, you should realize there's, there should be some valuable clues here. If I think I have an uh, a timing fault because I see it on the exhaust side, I know darn well because this is a single overhead camshaft that I should see the same fault on the intake side as well. So we know the exhaust valve is supposed to open before bottom dead center, maybe 45 degrees before, maybe even 60 before on some engines. But this one's happening right at bottom dead center. So clearly it shifted to the right and right meaning retarded or late. Being a single overhead camshaft design engine, the intake valve event appears to be shifted to the right as well. It's supposed to open at about 360, but it's not. It's opening at about 30 degrees after top dead center. Same thing with our intake valve closing. It's supposed to close at about 55 or maybe 60. It appears to be closing to the right, about 75 degrees after bottom dead center. So everything on the exhaust and the intake side is shifted to the right. Here's the exact opposite. This is a single overhead camshaft design, but this one has advanced camshaft timing. So everything is shifted to the left. Instead of opening at about 30 or 45 degrees before bottom dead center, our exhaust valve is opening about 65 or 70 degrees before bottom dead center. Our intake camshaft isn't opening at about 360. It's opening earlier, maybe at about, uh, looks like 25 degrees before bottom dead, top dead center. Our deepest vacuum isn't occurring at about 40 degrees after bottom de top dead center. It's opening almost at top dead center. And our intake valve closing isn't happening here at about 60 degrees after bottom dead center. It's happening at about maybe 30 degrees after bottom dead center. So my point is everything is shifted to the left. Now, look at this pocket. Remember we talked about pocket differential and when a cylinder has leakage, this pocket tends to drop very low, kind of uh, we would expect, oops, one moment here. We would, yikes, get a different color. Getting cocky. Yeah, this would tend to drop, if we call this normal here, this tends to drop very low when we have a leak. But what happens, when we have an advanced camshaft, why would it cause my pocket to shift higher? Let's talk about that for a moment. If our pocket, excuse me, or if we have 20 inches of mercury trapped here and pressure begins to increase because we go up on compression, when we pull that piston back down to where we came from, we should be able to achieve the same level of vacuum in the cylinder. So if I follow this trend right here, we could see that the valve timing happened on time, our pocket would drop low. But if we shift to the left or earlier, we relieve that vacuum. So watch my hand here. If we started off with vacuum, 20 inches of mercury, we go up on compression and we produce pressure. As we come back down to where we started, we would produce vacuum. But if I opened up the intake valve right here, we relieve that vacuum early. 
And the this, exhaust, the exhaust valve. I think you said intake, just to make sure everybody's clear on that. I'm sorry. That's I fine. The exhaust. When we open up our exhaust valve early, we don't give that cylinders the ability to pull a nice deep vacuum again. Does that make sense? Throw some hands. Yeah, please. If you guys, if if what I just said makes sense to you, please put your hands up. Thank you. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys are still with me. Now let's talk about high compression for a moment. If we normally close the intake valve right here, we capitalize on this much stroke to build compression, but because we're advanced, we don't close it here. We close the intake valve here and trap more air in the cylinder. If I take more air and squeeze it very, very small, what's that gonna to do to compression? It's gonna drive our compression numbers higher. That's why advanced camshaft timing can cause higher compression. Now, honestly, I remember being a kid and not knowing anything about engine dynamics. And one of the older guys, if I said, I suspect my, my timing chain has jumped, it was very common for somebody to say, well, check your compression. If your compression is lower, it probably jumped. What they never told me is, what if it jumped advanced? Couldn't that trap more air in the cylinder make my compression look even higher? It could make a weak cylinder actually look healthy. So keep in mind, when you advance an intake valve, you trap more air in the cylinder. When you retard an intake valve, you trap less air in the cylinder. And since this is a single overhead camshaft design, if the cam moves, the intake valve is going to move as uh, closing is going to move as well. This is a late exhaust camshaft. This one is of a dual overhead camshaft design, meaning there's nothing wrong on the intake side, only the exhaust side. Now, the first thing I note is higher running compression. Now, wait a minute. I just said that the exhaust valve timing or exhaust cam timing almost never affects compression. Think about it like this though. On a dual overhead camshaft, if our exhaust camshaft is late, meaning it's held off its seat longer, we fill that cylinder with not only fresh air and fuel, but also hot exhaust gases. If those exhaust gases are hot, they expand and take up more space than cold exhaust gases, and that could boost compression as well. But we have straight towers because we don't have a significant loss in pressure. We have late exhaust valve opening, and this can affect your exhaust uh, pocket depth because just like we discussed here in this last one, if we're severely early, it's going to elevate. If we're very late, our pocket might drift a little lower. Slight pocket differential here. So we have elevated peak vacuum, meaning our induction stroke didn't pull down as deep. Why? Because now we have hot exhaust pressure inside the cylinder. And we can't, even if we're exposed to the intake manifold, that hot exhaust gas is taking up space and it's not allowing a deep vacuum. So we're going to skip over this one for now because we're going to cover this in a case study coming up in our next successive session. I do want to mention this real quick. Talk about compression loss. This is a late intake camshaft and dual overhead camshaft design, meaning we only have a fault on the intake side, nothing wrong with the exhaust side, and that should be evident here. Our exhaust valve is opening at about maybe 30 degrees before bottom dead center, which could be quite normal. However, we have very uneven pockets. It's typical to see two or three PSI differential and still be healthy. Anything more than that indicates a loss of cylinder charge. And in this case, it's not because the cylinder is leaking like we have a compromised valve sealing issue or we have rings that are leaking or a scored cylinder wall. It's because with a late intake valve closing, watch this, if I trap only this much air in the cylinder like this, oops, like this, if I come back down on the expansion stroke, look what's building in the cylinder. That's vacuum. So what happens here is we squeeze that little bit of air because we trapped, uh, we left the intake valve open so long that we only trapped a little bit of air. We build pressure and as we expand now, we've got a full stroke going down. That cylinder zeroes out right here. And then we have another, looks like 120 degrees to pull a vacuum. So does that make sense? Please put your hands up if it makes sense while we have a very deep exhaust pocket there. Good. I'm glad you're with me. Thank you. So here, our piston at top dead center begins to descend, and we start to build a vacuum in the cylinder. Watch this. So we go up on our exhaust stroke, right? Our exhaust valve closes. Our intake valve is supposed to open, and we're supposed to inhale air. But since our intake valve is late because our camshaft is late, we start to draw down on an induction stroke, but we can't get air in and we start to build a vacuum. And then the valve opens. Listen to this. 
You hear that? That vacuum that you see, um, that you see right here is starting to disappear. And that occurs the moment the intake valve opens. So I hope that makes sense. Our intake valve is supposed to close somewhere over here where this first white cursor is, about 60 degrees after bottom dead center, but it shifted way to the right and it's closing at about 100 degrees after bottom dead center. And again, we push most of the charge out before we close the intake valve. That's why we only have, looks like 40 PSI of compression instead of maybe 100 or 120. So, <coughs> excuse me, we're gonna skip this as well. That's coming up in a case study. So before we get out of here, um, oh good, we got plenty of time here. I wanna talk about some valve clearance issues, okay? So for those of you that know me, I was at the Honda dealership as a dealership technician for most of my career. And um, those of you that are familiar with, I'll, I'll call them later model Hondas, maybe early to mid 2000s, later uh, 2008 maybe, Honda made a, uh, a car called a Honda Fit. Or those of you in Europe, they call them a Jazz, if you're familiar with them. Um, they might even have the Jazz in South America. I'm not sure. But anyhow, that engine had an issue of metallurgy within the valve train on some of their cars. So by way of a campaign recall, we were instructed as technicians to remove the valve cover for physical inspection of valve train components. And what we were in search for was a time and date stamp that was manufactured into the metal. Now, if the time and date stamp reflected that of one that was later than the recall. We were in the clear and we could simply reassemble the engine and, and, and get the customer on their way. However, if it was before the campaign and recall came out, we were supposed to disassemble the valve train, replace the damaged components on the bench, reassemble the valve train, and then perform a valve clearance adjustment check before we ship the car. The reason being is Honda, to be safe, instructed the technicians to loosen up the jam nuts and create a lot of lash in between the adjustable tappets and the top of the valve stem. So there's no binding when we disassemble it. The technicians got wise and they realized, wait a minute, if I don't move the valves at all, you know, I don't disassociate where they're, they're set at and I'm very careful. If I put the thing back together the way I had it, I shouldn't have to invest any time in a valve adjustment. Well, unfortunately it didn't work out that way. And many of the cars that were done the shortcut way came right back with a misfire, usually the next morning. So inevitably, I got one of these vehicles, and I was aware that this job was just performed, you know, yesterday. So I knew already I had to disassemble the top of the engine and adjust the valves. So what I decided to do was, just for the sake of sport and experience, I'm going to capture an in-cylinder compression event before I adjust the valves. I'm going to make the valve adjustment and then I'm going to repeat that same capture and just see if I can see a difference. This is how we learn. We practice on known good vehicles or vehicles that we're aware of what's wrong with. Right, Brent? You do that all the that's, time. That's a great point. And then especially when you're working your way through the learning curve, that using these testing techniques, you'll hear from many instructors that you want to work on known good cars so that you know exactly what to expect so that when something is bad, you know right away. But the other thing is, which I like what you call using your training wheels, is break out the test equipment on stuff where you already know what's wrong with it. And the other thing that you've mentioned in the past too is, you know, most technicians will use a cranking compression uh, test and then they'll back it up with a leak down test. Use these te testing techniques and then if you see evidence of a leaking intake valve, you know, back it up with a, a, a leak down text until you start to get real confident with this stuff. So yeah, great point. It, Cause you're not leaning on the test for any diagnostic value. You know, it's not going to sink your ship. If, if it doesn't make sense with what you find with your more conventional tests. Okay. Maybe you need a little bit more practice or maybe you're interpreting the data wrong, but what if it starts to back up what you already know and it becomes the easy go to test. Now you can take the training wheels off. You know what I mean? And start Absolutely. riding the bike by yourself. So this car came in with a problem uh, and it's, I, I figured it was the valve. So I removed the spark plug and um, I am going to capture the data as I did here. And I'm going to zoom in on this area right here for some detail. Now, what we can see here is if you recall from that recent capture here, um, our exhaust pocket, there is differential here, but it's not dropped below indicating a leak. It's elevated. 
indicating that perhaps this exhaust valve event occurred early, right? You remember that last one we did, Bryn? Yeah. So looking here, I see that my exhaust valve is opening at about 45 degrees before bottom dead center. This is bottom dead center 180. This is 30 degrees. This is 60 degrees. Right in the middle would be 45 degrees before bottom dead center. Now, if we go by the numbers, remember those rules of thumb, 45 degrees seems to be just fine. But uh, clearly, this isn't. So um, right now, does everybody that's paying attention, do you agree with me that perhaps this exhaust valve event is occurring early? Please uh, raise your hand. Yeah, Good. Yes. So early, watch this. If I have valve duration, this is when a valve opens and this is when a valve closes. Matter of fact, I'm going to draw this right here. If I have valve duration that looks something like this, this is when it opens and this is where it closes. If I open it uh, early, excuse me, if I tighten a valve, is it going to open early or is it going to open late? What do you guys think? Three, two, one. It's going to open early, Brandon. Okay. So it's going to open early. It's going to say right here. And Bryn, is it going to close early or is it going to close late? It's tight, so there's, there's not enough clearance there. It's going to close late. Okay. So this area right here, the duration got wider. It's open for a longer period of time. So now we look at the intake side. Our intake side, we anticipate opening at about top dead center compression. Excuse me, top dead center of the exhaust stroke. But here, it's not opening at 30 degrees before, but maybe 15 degrees before top dead center. So I think that's early as well. So if that's early, I'd anticipate, instead of having duration like that, this area right in here, we would call overlap. If it's happening earlier, excuse me, if that valve is tighter, it's going to open here and close later. That overlap is now this area right in here. Overlap is increased. So I'm going to inhale a lot more exhaust gases into the cylinder and disrupt combustion. And that is why I get a misfire like I had here. This is why the cylinder runs rough. So now I have a hypothesis. Um, I believe that I have a tight intake valve, right? Reduced clearance. And I believe I have a tight exhaust valve because they both appear to open early. Please raise your hands if you guys are agreeing with my thought process here. Excellent. So now I disassemble the engine. And Pedro nailed it on the head. EGR effect, right? If I get more exhaust gas in the cylinder than it's supposed to be there, isn't it just like holding the EGR valve open? It is. The only difference is it's affecting one cylinder because one cylinder's overlap is affected. Not all of them. This was a single cylinder misfire. So Those hot, hot rod guys in there, you know, that's yeah. that drag racing uh, rough idle syndrome. Too. Right. And when you step on that accelerator, that, that overlap really helps us. So we're going to talk about that in some case studies coming up. But think about this for a moment. I believe we're going to find a tight exhaust valve, meaning not enough clearance, and the same on the intake side. And guess what? That's exactly what I found. So I took the valve cover off. I measured it. High five to myself because I was right. <laughs> then I adjusted the valves to specification and I repeated this test. Oop, look at it now. Is this pocket even with that pocket now? Looks good, doesn't it, Bryn? It does. It we looks were great. all over at about 45 degrees. Now we're opening about 30 degrees before bottom dead center. Our intake valve was opening at about 15 degrees before bottom dead center, and now it's uh, before top dead center, and now it's opening at about zero degrees top dead center and our pockets are even. Hey guys, how do you think this engine ran when I was done with it? Worked pretty darn good, nice and smooth. Here's the difference side by side. So I hope that makes sense to you. This, is, this was a huge thing for me. I mean, this really happened. This was a live car that I captured probably eight, nine, 10 years ago almost. And I was like, like I had one of those woohoo moments, like I did it, right? I, I, I gathered some data. Maybe I wasted a little bit of time, but I learned from it and I just proved it. I saw, a made a hypothesis. I made a fix based upon that hypothesis. 
and I confirm <laughs> my fix. And Don't you have to take a moment and just tell somebody when that happens? Like, yeah. you just stop what you're doing and walk up to somebody. And, Look what I did. Yep. It's, <laughs> like, it's like the guy that just hits the home run. He runs up and down the, you know what I mean? <laughs> Get high fives from everybody. And this, this was a lot of fun for me. So, um, Jamie just asked the question, did I adjust just that cylinder with the misfire or did I adjust all the cylinders? Uh, Jamie, I always adjust all the valves because it, it always, it, it never, it never fails. You do, you do, you adjust the one valve and it's running good. And then suddenly the thing comes back a day later and then another cylinder's misfire. It's just like, you just do them all. It's just the way it, it's, it's one way to do that job. And you just adjust all the valves. It's a great question. You know what I mean? But uh, I did adjust them all. And some were tight and some were, were not that bad, but this one was so tight that the overlap generated a misfire. Not due to loss of compression, but the overlap created a disturbance in combustion because of the lack of air fuel concentration around that spark plug. I think Jamie was about to judge you if you said otherwise. He was just looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> so before we move on to a case study, I want to stop right here because We've got 12 minutes to answer some questions for you guys. And uh, we urge you to ask the questions because we want to get them answered. If you're thinking of it, anybody else that watches, there's a large percentage that are thinking it too, and they're just not saying anything. So yeah. please. Throw them them. up. While we wait for them, I guess I have one for you, Brandon. What's and it, may, it may be something we might want to talk about later on. So if that's the case, then don't hesitate to just tell me to, you know, <laughs> um, you know, when you have a leak, uh, in cylinder leak, it can kind of shift your tower. So maybe that when you put that cursor at the center of that tower, it can, it may not be representative top dead center. Do you have any kind of tips to try to kind of adjust where you put those cursors to try to find maybe a truer top dead center outside of maybe an ignition event? I'm going to answer this quickly and then I'm going to say, I'm, I got an idea in the presentation when I okay. can demonstrate it. But what Brent is getting at is, we t and correct me if I'm wrong, we typically think of peak pressure as the point top dead center occurs. That is yeah. typically almost always true. If we have a significant leak, though, we may build what, the, what we'll call peak compression, uh, what that cylinder is only capable of before top dead center. We just might not be able to go any further than that as the piston continues to, to uh, ascend towards the cylinder head. So um, typically, I like to reference the exhaust valve opening at that point in time as a point of reference and compare it from one cylinder to the next. So it's a great question, and I, I think that will be better answered if when I can show you. Yeah, I think so. Will you remind me of that? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Um, Pedro asks, how much advance can an intake be before it hits the piston? That is a phenomenal question. And one of the first things I'll say is we've all heard of interference engines and also engines that are not of an interference design. Um, for that same reason, um, intake valve timing and cam lift, lobe lift, infers how high that, how far that uh, valve stem will protrude when that valve is open. So it all depends on the design of the engine. Um, I've seen camshafts jump one or two teeth and it wasn't even the valves that hit the piston. It was the intake valve that hit the exhaust valve and they, they struck each other in the combustion chamber like that and they bent on each other. Uh, have you ever run into that, Bryn? Yeah. I cranked an engine over once and I heard <laughs> Oh no, that could be good. Again, we could probably get a little more advanced, but you mentioned, you know, you could, you could phase these cams when you're in the cylinder to kind of watch them phasing. And one thing that I would, the only tip that I want to bring to attention now, again, maybe a bit, a bit advanced, but be careful if you suspect that an intake cam maybe is already advanced and you're trying to differentiate whether it's timing or an actual phase problem. If it is already mechanically advanced and then you phase it more, you know, you might be looking at some trouble. So. And Pedro, um, to answer your question, we have a case study coming up uh, probably in night number four that reflects a severely advanced intake cam. I believe it closed 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120. I, I think it was 80 or 90 degrees late, believe it or not, like a quarter turn of the, uh, excuse me, uh, an eighth turn of the camshaft. And 
I mean, it still didn't hit the pistons. If it went any more, I guarantee you, you know, there would have been a collision, but it went that far, almost a hundred and I think it was 150 degrees of crankshaft rotation is when the intake valve finally closed and it still didn't hit the piston. But that's not the case on every engine. So uh, always shoot the line your timing marks up right. Don't worry about how far you can be off. But you can always back up your theory uh, if you suspect maybe a valve hit. Obviously, start with a cylinder leakage check. Now, just because it passes that check doesn't mean the valves didn't kiss the piston. If it passes that check, I might insert a bore scope into the, pist uh, into the combustion chamber and see evidence that piston valve collision occurred. And usually you'll see uh, a scratch in carbon, you know what I mean? Or if you have a decent bore scope that can turn around, you can see if there's a, a nick in a valve. But I always warn the customer, if I have to disassemble this engine, I say, listen, I did every test I can to prove uh, that there wasn't a collision and I see no evidence of one now. However, there is a possibility that the valve did hit the piston and it does seal, but it may bind in the guide. So just keep that door open and, and make your customer aware that it is a possibility that it did happen and you, and you should be okay. I hope that answers your question. Any more questions? Throw them up. Uh, we're caught up for now, Brandon. Okay. Well, I do appreciate you guys uh, contributing. And uh, please, anybody that's watching, when we come back for night two, come join us. It's a lot of fun. A lot more fun that way. Ken, do you have anything for us? Yeah, if you'll stop sharing your screen for a second so I can throw yeah. something up there, Brandon. I got, got carried away. No, that's okay. That's my <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I just want to remind you that um, if you want to find any of the previously recorded sessions, if you would like to view them, or if you want to find any uh, instructor-led classes or upcoming virtual classes, please go to our website at ctionline.com. Either look under the training tab in virtual classroom or go to the classes near me, and you should be able to find everything that's available. We'd also like to encourage all of you to join our CTI WTI members Facebook group. Uh, this is not a marketing uh, avenue for us. It's simply a way for us to stay in touch with our students. Uh, you'll find notifications of classes. You'll find tech tips. Um, interesting, a lot of interesting posts that go on there, things that people find. And uh, if, you're, if you're on Facebook, please do a search for us and join our group. Other than that, if we don't have any questions uh, tonight, uh, 